Back to talk to us again is Joe McDonald, who uh, fought in Ukraine for seven months with the International Legion. Um, so, you're back. What's it like to be back? Hello, Lloyd. Good to see you again. Um, so, yeah, when I last saw you, uh, when I was last in the studio here um, mm -hmm. at Castle Lloyd, I had been back, I think it was like a like a week or eight days, I'd, I'd got back. I remember, back. yeah, it was, wasn't very long. You no, just had the clothes with you. Yeah, You'd wash your uniform once, I remember yeah, I got back. I got back, I went to Liverpool, got stinking drunk with my brother for a few days. Right. Uh, and then went to my mum and dad's house, you know, mm -hmm. had a shower, visited me nan, who doesn't know I'm at war, fortunately, she didn't watch YouTube. Oh. And, um, and, you know, and then was like, strike while the iron's hot get up to you so i came up right. and i so i decided to wear the uniform because i thought it was sensible lots of people didn't like that i guess yeah probably because the, the british army got scared of wearing uniform because of the ira at one point so it's not you know it's not the dumb thing anymore but i was never subject to any of those rules anyway so. right and you <laughs> seem you seem quite proud of the uniform right. I mean, you it, had it just seemed it. appropriate at the time and like it'd only been washed once since i got back so I don't know. But, and you didn't um, have that many clothes. No, no, uh, I, I hadn't been had, anywhere I had, near. I think I had one change of clothes had, at the time. I hadn't been anywhere near, near any shops or anything. I'd just right. basic, I'd basically come as directly from the front as it was possible to, without mm. with still giving time to see my, my brother and my mum and dad. Um, right, but now you're, you're back in your normal civvies. Yeah, my normal civvies. Oh, well, actually, you've hurtled here straight from, from Morocco. Yes. Which, so, but this is, your, is this your new look? I mean, Fez, they, are, <laughs> they are cool. They are. It's very comfy. You know, yeah, I think um, everyone will be wearing them soon. So yeah, I think I'm hoping I can make them a fashion again. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but yeah, I uh, when I as on the last video, mm -hmm. I was talking about how I was planning to go and start a career uh, working for a, a landmine charity. Yes, Vietnam. And um, yeah, I, I would still love to make that part of my future, but it hasn't quite happened. Oh. I was I met someone in Kiev who worked for um, Mine Action Group. Uh, mag and uh, it seemed to be said to me that if I applied and sent him a CV then I could very quickly become a team leader which is someone who would look after right. uh, a group of people who were going out uh, deactivating landmines and then through the course of looking after them and doing courses you would become an operative uh, and, and have the same skills as them but you start off like looking after the operatives and okay. kind of learning from them and uh, I, I, I don't want to become some person on the on YouTube talking about gender politics, right? I think that's a really I have a feeling you're just about to anyway, really but boring, here it comes. Really boring subject. But um, when I had to go, they weren't. I sort of got ghosted by this guy from Maggie. Stopped replying to me, and um, I don't know why. I mean, hang on, someone who clears landmines for a, for a living, who then starts ghosting you. I mean, that, yeah, does that not worry you at all? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, he was more of an opera. He was more of a manager, not someone who actually goes out and deactivates bombs. Okay. Um, but he he ghosted me, so I went through the normal process of applying for for Mag and other landmine charities. And one of the things they want you to have now is a degree in social sciences, preferably gender story, studies, to go and scrape dirt off bombs. So, okay. well done, woke people. Because of that, someone like me can't be out in the world scraping dirt off bombs and making it a bit safer for little kids right well, now. Well, maybe you will still. I mean, it could be. I'm well, only just, guessing here, but it could be that there won't get many people with degrees in gender studies applying. Well, if I just go to university, if I just wait three years to go and learn my pronouns properly, then I can go and scrape dirt off bombs, apparently. So, yeah. Well, so you that's... don't want to mispronoun a mine. Cause, exactly. Because you know, that's the last thing you want to do is, imagine is, is offending annoy a mine. Man, you know. So, yeah, so that's why I'm not doing that. But uh, oh. hope the, the, the qualifications to do it, to become privately qualified and then be pretty much able to get a job in that field anyway you want are about 15 grand. Right. So that's something I'm working on. Um, but right now, um, yeah, because that didn't happen, um, off the back of your interviews, quite a lot of people wanted mm -hmm. me to do other interviews. And quite a lot of people wanted me to write articles. And I had a go at doing it, and a few people have approached me and said, "Oh, we'd like to ghostwrite a book about your thing." And I, oh, I don't know, I've, I didn't quite pursue too many of those inquiries, and I started writing an article 
because they offered me a few quid and I can, you know, like most ex-veterans, I'm teetering on the line between adventurer and homeless person at the moment. So a bit mm -hmm. of money would be good. So I started writing this article and 3,000 words became like 13,000 in a day. Right. And uh, I'm, I am dyslexic and I'm not like the most educated person in the world, but I did used to write for a magazine in Berlin and I did used to write little stories about my travels. So mm -hmm. having had... Uh, a bit a little bit of money at the moment i decided to go to morocco because it's cheap and it's sunny right and um just get my head down and write a book and that's what i've been doing for the last three months basically uh -huh. and i have now written just under seventeen thousand words of the book so 17 Se seventy thousand seven oh three o's yes um and i we i'd say we're about 90 percent done so, so yeah, that's something I've been doing, and I, I have to admit, I'm quite proud of myself. I uh, have worked, you know, doing seventy thousand words in that sort of time frame mm -hmm. is is hard. And, and one of the things it's taught me is, you know, as it's always said, you know, these history books that are written hundreds of years after an event, and yet somehow we still take with some degree of credibility. Mm. Um, it's so incredibly hard to remember. Ha everything that happened and the correct sequence of events that things happened in a six month period. Yes. It's really, really difficult. I've gone back to it so many times and been like, oh, fuck me, I've, I've missed out a complete bit where like the building we were in got hit and we were all scrambling out. I'm like, that just, that little incident that for a civilian would be one of the most dramatic. Uh, and, and, and defining experience of the lives was just another thing that happened. And there were so many things like that. I mean, whilst that it was actually happening, it must have seemed at least fairly dramatic. Well, yeah, but then it stops and then you just go back to normal things and then something else happens that eclipses that or makes you forget about it, you know? Right. And such is the nature of things. So I've it, there's been a much a lot of going back and going back and adding, adding stuff that mm. I've forgotten... Uh, and I'm now working with a couple of people uh, who were also serving with me, right. who are um, who who are sort of providing accounts um, uh, for 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 things that I didn't quite see because yeah. I wasn't quite there to sort of try and give the fullest, unofficial, definitely unofficial mm -hmm. history of me and the Legion in the first seven months, basically. Right. One of the the uh, the I hope I'd, I'd hate it if people thought I was trying to play on people's heartstrings. But one of the hard things for me is through the course of this book, about twice, about once a fortnight, someone I know has died. Right. And I have had to alter about them in the book or include more, mm -hmm. and added a obituary basically. Yeah. More, more times than I've got fingers on my hands already. You know. So yeah. that's. Yeah, that make at least in in a, in a, in a terrible and very grim way that at least makes it a unique bit of art that tells a unique story, I guess. So perhaps that's a good thing. I'm not sure yet, but I will it will hopefully you know a bit. I, I fully intend if the book sells any copies that a very large percentage of the profit will be going to uh, to the Legion and other Ukrainian mm. funds. Um, well, you've been quite successful there. You've been raising funds, haven't well, you? Well, I mean, uh, through the, the various... Uh, I haven't... The, the, the donation options through the videos we've done haven't all been to the Legion, but some of them have directly been to units in the Legion. Mm -hmm. uh, some have been to other landmine charities and stuff like that. But uh, from what I hear, and I haven't been... A, getting guys to check bank account details or on the front is quite difficult, but as far as I know, our block of videos has got up to about 30,000. And some people what, have, pounds? Uh, yeah, euros, pounds, dollars, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. It all gets translated into a Rivner anyway, but yeah. But right. it's, it's raised a fur whack and uh, I've had little thank you notes from people. Well, and that's a lot of tea and chocolate. It's a lot of tea and chocolate and it's potentially also, you know, uh, more substantial equipment like night vision goggles and things to make drones be more deadly or effective. Right. Uh, so that's good. Okay. And uh, also, um, uh, some people have directly contacted me through through you, 
who have now been donating uh, like quite substantial amounts of money, like £500 here, £1,000 there, that I have been uh, directly uh, passing on to the Legion and to drone groups in Ukraine to help the Legion with um, observation and peaceful purposes only drone stuff. Um, right. Definitely that. Okay. And uh, you've been speaking, you were speaking in York just a couple of days ago. How did that go? Oh, yeah, well, the York Dialectic uh, Association, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right as a, as a, as a public speaker now, uh, asked me to come and speak up in York. And mm -hmm. uh, that we had about 60, 60 or so people in the audience yeah. uh, in, a, in a lovely little medieval guild hall, the Butcher's Guild Hall. Oh, very nice. Um, yes, very nice building. And uh, But so speaking of other you know, tiny uh, organisations that you know, possibly need a shout out, um, you're, you're going to be speaking somewhere else, aren't you? Uh, in in is it Brussels? Oh, well, yes. Uh, th as part of what I've been doing since I left, other than writing the book, is... Working with um, an NGO mm -hmm. that uh, helps investigate war crimes, and I, I can't say too much about this at all because it's part of ongoing investigations, you know, into uh, international criminal court stuff. But I've been helping right. with that, and part of that has led me to be speaking at the EU uh, with a group called All Eyes on Wagner, um, who right. are uh, expressly trying the e uh, to get the EU to. Uh, make as many legal problems as they can for Wagner, private military contractor, um, who, for those who don't know, are like Russia, uh, Russia's version of Blackwater, uh, right. only worse. Um, and yeah, we're, I've been working towards that. So I'll be speaking, uh, humble Joe McDonald from Ellesmere Port will be speaking right. at the EU Parliament in Brussels. Your mum must be so proud. She, I think she is quite proud. My mum and dad are, are uh, a little, were a little gobsmacked when I told them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I'll be off the soon. Um, and yeah, hopefully in some small way, I because uh, I, I I actually don't have. I'd just like to make clear now that I I think I might have been shelled by Wagner, mm -hmm. but I haven't got any direct personal experience of fighting them. I mean, apparently they were across the river from us at the same time, but you can't tell. You yeah. know what I mean? They're, they're not walking around with a thing that says Wagner above right. their head. You know, their, their shells just go bang like all just the, rest. the same. So yeah. yeah, but so I'll be uh, basically recounting other people's stories and uh, basically just being a spokesman for other people's experiences because it appears I can tell a good story. So if I can help in that small way, then I can. Okay. Um, but still, it's quite an honour, and I hope I uh, represent uh, what I'm meant to represent well. Oh, hello. I say, you don't have any bad habits, do you, that you'd like to tell me about? Oh, you do? Oh, how delicious. Do tell. You want to give them up? Oh, well, yeah, I suppose you would, wouldn't you? You would want to give them up. I mean, yes, if you yourself think it's a bad habit, then, yeah, you'd want to give it up. And, ah, perhaps that's where my sponsor might help you, because this is the product of my sponsor, and this is my sponsor's name. You might think it's fun. You'd be wrong. You might think with the umlaut it's fum, but no, it's fum. And uh, I think the umlaut was a canny piece of future-proofing because they may yet want to diversify into heavy metal. Now, what is it? Well, it's a tube through which you breathe flavoured air. That's pretty much all it is, really. There are uh, there's no active ingredients, uh, no electronics. Um, this one is the Solano version. It has a walnut barrel, very fancy, and an onyx, oh yes, onyx-covered uh, mouthpiece for extra smoothness. And it is, it is ever so smooth. Um, and, well, I don't know what you do. I mean, possibly you eat too many biscuits or, or you bite your nails or you bite somebody else's nails. Or... No, that's too weird. You wouldn't do that. But anyway, you have some habit that perhaps you'd rather uh, replace with this habit. And uh, then you can breathe flavoured airs of various kinds through the little adjustable dial at the end. And um, perhaps you just love it.
And if you want to try it, well, you could click the link in the description or you could go to tryfume.com stroke Lindia Beige. And then using that code this month, if you act quickly, you will get 20% off everything on the site. Or if you're a little bit more tardy, 10% off. But it's still 10%. I mean, yeah, it's still, you don't complain. Um, now, there are two main kinds of advertising in this world. There's the, the type which tries to persuade you to buy something that you already know about, but it's just telling you that it's cool or something. Yeah. Do I look cool? No, of course I don't look cool, because I'm me and I've never looked cool. But this this is the other sort of type of advert, which is just telling you about something which you didn't perhaps you know about before. And so 150,000 people around the world, I have been told, have given this a go and many of them have found that it helped them kick some habit or other. So if you want to get rid of those biscuits or um, uh, the, the nail biting, or in my case, it's punching people, uh, you could try Fume and you could click the link in the description or you could scan in the... Um, uh, the code which is doubtless appearing on your screen now and that should do the trick. Now, of course, what I've not done yet is put in one of the little flavoured cartridges and given it a go. Well, uh, what we got, this one is orange vanilla or I think it must be orange and vanilla. Um, and uh, this one is uh, raspberry lemon. Yeah, that's not the type of raspberry. Yeah, that'll be uh, raspberry and lemon. This is crisp mint. Crisp and mint or is, is crisp a type of mint of, of which I was here, hitherto unaware. Uh, this one is white cranberry. White and cranberry? No, I think it must be a type of cranberry. Again, didn't know that one. Uh, maple pepper? Probably could be a type of pepper. I'm guessing it's maple and pepper. And this one is sparkling grapefruit. And uh, I think sparkling surely must describe grapefruit. Um, I think the packaging designers could possibly have made more liberal and informative use of the word and. Anyway, I'm rather partial to a bit of grapefruit, so I'm going to give this one a go. So I tear the thing open and I get in there. Um, and, oh, yep, that's uh, fairly grapefruity. And I take out the little uh, cartridge thingy, put it in the trench. Like that. And here we go. My first hit of fume. does sparkle a bit and that's grapefruity yeah definitely better than biting someone else's nails now when you were here last time you uh, held up uh, your your id card that showed that you were one of the originals mm -hmm. you were 0012 mm -hmm. um but it seems that there are very few originals still with the legion that's true i mean when i when i left other people who'd been in at the start left at the same time. Mm. When I, you know, and people have been through the winter campaign that was obviously very tough. The the Legion after the fighting basically stabilised, the, the Lions stabilised again in Kharkiv, were pretty much up against the Luhansk border mm. and uh, were continuing to hold like a defensive action there. And um, as far as I know, um, a lot more people very recently have uh, have left uh, mm. and it's out of the originals i think there's two or three left two or three and they've been fighting continuously for 10 months yeah i think a lot of the reg the, the 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 legion has been in the lines for 10 months now mm. there's 10 months of actual combat and you're meant to do three at a time they're meant to rope three on the line rotate out whether it's for a month or three months Right. You know, rest, re-equip, retrain, and mm -hmm. then back in. But that hasn't been the case. The Legion's been hard in the lines for 10 months. And uh, I believe that a lot of them left because they, the rumour or the orders were that they were about to be used uh, as, a, as a forward element of the next counter-offensive. And uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people thought that after 10 months in the line and no opportunity to do proper assault training, that that was asking a bit much. And I don't blame any of them. They right. ruled that every last one of those men have done their bit, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, so, yeah. And those who decide to stay, I respect deeply and I love some of them. Just try and keep your heads down, lads. You've done your bit, you know. Right. So... Morale is key to the, the fighting effectiveness of soldiers. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's one of the major, as I said last time, the major advantage that you can never quite quantify on lists of army strengths is motivation and morale. 
Right. The Ukrainians have got bags of it and the Russians would appear to have very little. So that's mm. one of the major, major factors that's been on Ukraine's side all, all, all the way through. And like I said, the, the morale in the early days of the Legion, even with all the adversities and bad commanders, had, was tremendous because it was just such a wonderful and exciting part of history to mm -hmm. be in. And there were so many good guys around and there were so many people with good attitudes around who were yeah. like carrying the spirit, you know, making the spirit de corps from from the ground up, you know. Right. That was great, but... Uh, you say ground up, but officer down, you have to have faith in your officers to well, yeah. sustain morale. Yeah, and then there's, yeah. there's officers and then there's the sort of international NCOs who, you know, sometimes are your fire team or squad or uh, platoon commander. Mm -hmm. And then there's these other international NCOs we seem to get who become important, but how and why is more confusing. Right, so you, know, you were telling me about a, an article that has appeared in the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I spoke a great length about Bogdan in the last videos. Bogdan the Inept, our second and main, the Legion's most notorious commander. Right. And, uh, and then he, you know, when we got to like the front, he like got kicked out then. And I didn't really mention anything else about him, but a short while later, he managed, because he's obviously got, like, power and political connections and mm -hmm. stuff, he managed, despite the fact that, like, he'd been pushed out, disgraced, and it was very clear that everyone thought, you know, he was corrupt and incompetent and we didn't want him, you know, that much that there'd been a petition and everything that Ukrainian officers had signed, you know. All right. Like, yeah, it, you know, everyone had there'd been a rebellion, you know what I mean? A yeah. paperwork rebellion. He managed to go off and start... 3rd Battalion of the Legion, that somehow, despite the fact he's a shit infantry commander, was a Special Forces Battalion. And then he's been doing that, and it was a joke for a while. And then a, then it some they, they sort of built the numbers up. I was never around to hear of it, but then it seemed after I left that there was a bit where 3rd Battalion was, like, not a joke... Mm -hmm. And some people from first were going over there and possibly because they were just offering the opportunity to do more gung-ho missions, right? And there's always a bunch of idiots who just want to go on the gung-ho missions. Right. And, you know, there's been a lot of casualties. So, yeah, you know, sounds pretty gung-ho to me. Mm. And um, and then he, he's managed to create this thing. And then recently, it, it, play, it it's the, the, there were people who I knew, who I've met who were over in third, who who were these sort of... They they had power. They seemed to be some sort of NCO-type level mm. in the Legion. But what they actually did was a bit more confusing because you've, you've got, like, Malcolm Nance, who's an MSBC commentator, and apparently he was a big, famous spy in... Uh, a in, famous in, in, spy? Yeah, he was a, he's a notable intelligence operative and commentator. Mm. And he's he's been, you know, he's in, been speaking to the New York Times and stuff. So uh, the thing is... Oh, so he himself yeah. spoke to them? All yeah, right. I mean, it's, so pretty, clear, he it's, it's like pretty clear he has spoke to them through reading that article. Right. And it's like, when Malcolm was in 1st Battalion, right... I don't know anyone. He's, I've seen him say on videos, my activities take me to the front line every day. Well, let me tell you something, right? The combat zone is 100 kilometres fucking wide, right? So you could be 99 kilometres away from the Russians and still be in the combat zone, right? Malcolm Nance never went to an OP. Malcolm Nance right. has never been on the front line. That's the observation post right at the front. If I'm wrong, if there's a legionnaire out there who's actually seen him within rifle shot or even mortar of the Russians, I'd be very fucking surprised. And uh, he's, he has bought lots of stuff from the Legion and did this other guy called Ben Lackey, who a while ago I sort of considered a friend. But apparently, according to the New York Times and lots of other people who were speaking to me, mm -hmm. he was never in the US Marines at all and he was never a millionaire and a lot of the money he's raised from the Legion has sort of been embezzled or conned or some of the money that's come in, he's actually misdirected. And there's all... I, I, I couldn't speak to all the details, but the fact that there have been, these guys were banging on about internal problems in the Legion on Twitter... Mm -hmm. While they were still in the Legion, fucking months. And they've had this... There's this other character called uh, Eliza Falk, 
who's been in the papers as well, okay. who somehow came in to the the Legion and became like the, the communications director, whatever the fuck rank that is in the army. And uh, that she was in charge of like the Legion PR. And we met her because... This is Mockingjay, yeah, isn't it? Mockingjay, okay, yeah, Mockingjay, yeah. Because I remember when you were out there, I was emailing back and forth with Mockingjay. And I, I, I did find her a little bit difficult to Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, because they she wanted... She played her cards very close to her chest. They wanted to sort of arrange an interview between me and you while I was over there. But yeah. then it didn't happen because of... Several like, times. ...timing and counter-offensive and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, but yeah, she... Uh, it, it came out and it's been in... I think the Times and the Telegraph and then ABC Australia yeah. that she has she's wanted for she basically like was on some Australian TV show some reality and show, tried to it? buy yeah. a house and she didn't really have the money for it and then she she basically was thought of as a con artist and she owed people a fair bit of money mm. and she was off in the Canary Islands then and apparently some other they tracked her down there and she was involved in some other property scam. And then next thing, she turned up. Uh, she turned up in Ukraine, and she's become, you know, the the the, uh, you know, she's one of these sort of headquarters legionnaire people. Like she's she spent all the time at Yaraviv, a little bit of time in Rivna, which was like the training base in the middle where we met her, mm. and then she's off in Kiev, and you know. When you're at the front line, you don't really know what's going on in Kiev, but apparently she's in charge of the funds. And, you know, we're, we're getting... The Legion's getting loads of shit from, do, uh, from volunteers. And when I say shit, I mean just that. You know, we're getting some useful things, like head torches and socks, but we're also getting some completely useless things, like why are people even sending it? And things like vehicles and decent optics and all the kind of stuff we really want mm -hmm. are in short supply but apparently there's bloody millions coming into this legion fund or hundreds of thousands and okay you say apparently so none of this you actually know no we you know we, we have get reason told, to suspect we get told by some nco that x stuff is meant to be coming and we know it's there and it's in kiev and then it just keeps going missing but it's in the nature of of army, uh, armies with the and the confusion of war that untrue rumours are, are going to circulate. Yeah, for sure. So the, the, the straight fact of the matter is, like, how someone who had a reputation as being a, a criminal, you know, investigations into him, was wanted as a con artist, became in charge of the Legion's volunteer funds during wartime, mm. and that lots and lots of people don't trust her and like her, and yet she's still there. And then apparently there's this, all this corruption she knows about with Ukrainian officers who are involved in the Legion that's been in the papers too. I mean, mm. as a grunt on the ground, I don't know exactly who's responsible for these things, but mm. some bastard at headquarters is stealing, that much is certain, you know? So in the case of, of Mockingjay, I remember um, researching her a bit when you were still over there and finding articles about the, the various cons and scams that she'd... Uh, operated in uh, Australia and then yeah there were other places and yet it seems very odd for someone who is who would pull that sort of con to to volunteer I know what where can I find some you know some easy con to go I know I'll join an army during an actual war well you know I mean be, you, joining an army during a war I mean she was knew she was going to be in some headquarters element and you know, if if you want a chaotic environment where mm. there's big piles of valuable stuff just lying around, wartime. I, I suppose, <laughs> but also if you're trying to redeem yourself, if you think, oh, actually, I've been caught. The world, you know, there there are these articles about me online. You know, how can I redeem myself? How can I start yeah, again? It's I possible. know I am going to do the right but thing I've, and volunteer it. I've had a drink with her in Kiev, yeah. and I've not personally mm -hmm. got anything against her. She might be. She might have come there to absolve herself. She might have been 100% honest with every single penny that's come into the Legion. But, you know, it seems unlikely. Oh. <laughs> uh, and lots of people uh, don't think it is. But the fact, the fact that, like, even after everyone found out, and, like, why do we have a fucking con artist in charge of our funds? You know? I mean, fact of the matter is, I've never felt safe to send any of the funds that... That 
we could we got from the videos directly to a place where she could get her hands on it. I've gone round the other bit and made sure okay, you've always circumnavigated di di directly it. to people online or right. to another char charity that my friend Carl Larson mm -hmm. has set up that's American based, but still you can donate to it and directly fund the lesion that way right. and stuff like that. So yeah, I've I've chose to to make sure that any money that people want to give as a result of me speaking, mm -hmm. has gone directly to people I know and trust on the front lines or who are directly supporting people on the front lines and basically has skipped out high command and that bit of it completely. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like I'm the first person who feels this way about it, you know what I mean? I'm, you know, sorry if anyone okay. thinks I'm giving yeah. the game away, but I think the New Fine. York Times and the, the multiple major newspaper articles have beaten okay. people to let's, it. Let's move on. Let's move on. Now, one thing that um, I regretted not asking you last time you were here is why did you leave? Because yeah. there, there comes a point, we, we talked about how there aren't many originals left and how when the mor you know, morale cracks, that's when you leave. Um, I'm not saying that your morale necessarily cracked, but I mean, there, there is a reason where it, it, you came to a point where you thought, right, I've had enough, I'm off. Yeah, I mean, the end of the counter-offensive happened and, you know, I've just uh, just blacked that Ukrainian officer's eye and my mate's like, well, yeah, right. I would actually booked my leave uh, to go. Um, I was meant to be in Germany while the counter-offensive was happening, visiting this girl. Mm -hmm. But then at the last minute, the counter-offensive happening, and then she told me she'd had a bad dream about me being a soldier and didn't want to continue the thing. Oh. So I was like, oh, well, cheers, you know, thanks. I was going to escape war and have a couple of weeks' romance, but so now... you got a, a, John, a Dear John email. Yeah, I got a Dear John email and then, just, and then went off to take part in the biggest battle since World War II. And then that ended, and I, I'm, I was like, right, so two weeks' leave. So I went on my two weeks leave and uh, I, during that time, uh, basically at the at, while at the end of the counteroffensive that I found out just as I, the guys had said, okay, you can go and leave. And they took me back to our house where we keep all our stuff. Mm. Uh, I found out that my friend, Ben, Benjamin Garley, um, who was a Dutch Italian kid, uh, had been killed. And um, through the course of, of, now I'm on leave in Kiev, mm. And, you know, I thought a few days off, some cocktails, some nice meals, maybe go to a spa, you know, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. have some real rest, you know, would would refresh me. And um, I found that, you know, it's, it sounds like such a cliche thing to say, but, like, I couldn't sleep without the noise of fucking shelling. Mm. Spent my entire time just, like, not sleeping. Uh, on my leave and then uh, I went to Ben's funeral um, he got he got and his parents had come mm. over and you know quite a lot of people have died up by this point now but Ben like he just looked so different embalmed he didn't look like Ben anymore and it was mm. you know just it got to me it got to me mm -hmm. and meeting his meeting his parents and all that, it, it got to me. Like Ben, Ben had come into the war with no military experience. He was, it was an earth softer, but he was a good lad. He wasn't one of these twats who thought he knew everything, you know? Mm -hmm. He listened and he worked hard and he was really liked, like Ben was lovely, you know what I mean? Everyone really liked him. And it was another, he was doing everything right when he got killed as well. He was in behind hard cover mm -hmm. with, and it like, sort of the shrapnel like came in through an opening, bounced off a wall, bounced off another wall and hit him in the head, you know, there was like, it was kind of a one in a million type thing, you know, and yeah. it, none of us, none of us expected it. And, um, and yeah, that, it got, it got to me. And so that presumably I, was the straw that broke and, the camel's and that back. As well, being on leave gave me an opportunity to have some like really long conversations with like friends and family. And, you know, you're like, I had, because of the magic of the internet, it's, you know, I, we weren't, you were able to get messages and stuff off your mum and dad, but I, I wasn't trying to speak to my parents every day and I told them not to. Mm. It was like, look, no news is, is good news, you know, and it's, it's really quite distracting trying to think about your family and your emotions when you're doing a job like that. So you really are better just kind of pushing it to one side, compartmentalising it, you know. Okay. 
So yeah, and I also noticed a few other things like, you know, I, I'm 39 and uh, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not like the most athletic person in the world. I've taken quite a knocks and injuries over my life and through the course of the war, you know, I've had to throw myself at the hard ground, be it concrete or rocks or even off a short cliff or in a in bit of an embankment mm. a lot of times. And uh, I really noticed on the leave that, like, my knees, my lower back, my ankles are all just fucked, you know. Mm. And walking around Kiev was, like, really bloody painful. And I'm just not... I'm not meant to be an infantryman anymore. And, um, and then while I was on leave in Kiev mm -hmm. at this nice hotel uh, that I picked for myself, um, there was some... People I met who worked for charities, like the Mine Action Group guy, and there were also some people who worked for NGOs and stuff, and both of them... Uh, and I was even hanging out with the director of the Red Cross, who's a Frenchman uh, who's operating in Ukraine, really nice guy. Mm -hmm. And um, they were all sort of seeming to be saying that, yeah, you know, like, useful employment that can help the world and humanity in, in Ukraine is something that you could quite easily get in our field. And I was like, oh, OK, you know, what mm. I fundamentally want to do is to, like, help people and help Ukraine. And uh, I'd probably be far better doing that, you know, deactivating landmines or working for a charity than I would be in a soldier at the end of the day. You know, my because mm. I'd, I'd also, you know, there was other things like knowing that I had not got out of bed for mortars and stuff and artillery quite a few times already that, frankly, my ability to control my drinking problem was was on the wobble. That was that was for certain, you know, like the amount of... But did that affect you when you were at the front? Well, I mean, not when we were actually at the front, but like getting too pissed and chinning an officer at the, en at the end. I mean, admit, like I said, the officer got pissed first, but like, hmm. Stu, so that was, that was like, that was pretty bad. I really okay. shouldn't have done that. And that, that was, that was bad discipline. And like, you know, when when we'd been in quarters over the last couple of months, you know, the the urge to just, you know, when you're not on an OP and you know nothing's going to happen, that having one or two beers is something that soldiers do. Mm. But more times than once, I'd been having more than one or two beers. Okay. And that hadn't, that had been something I'd, that very few people had known about and hadn't affected my work, you know. People still were, knew that I was working hard, mm. but but I knew, mm -hmm. but I knew that I was finding it really hard to not want to have a bit more alcohol than I should to deal with the incredible amount of fucking stress you're under. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what can I say? I'm far from the perfect human being, far from the perfect soldier, but that's the truth of it. You know, I knew that my morale. Uh, and my willpower and my discipline and everything about me was on the wane. And I'd given them, I'd given Ukraine and the Legion seven months of hard work. Mm. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that's I did my okay. thing. So, you just what, told them that you weren't coming back. Well, I be I came back from my leave early, mm. and I went and got my stuff, and I left officially with all paperwork and all kit handed in during the course of my leave. Basically, so they didn't raise a hand to stop you. The, it's a volunteer thing. The original contract we had mm. was that they can keep us till the end of the war, but that very quickly got changed to you can leave whenever you want, and it was like one years or three years, but you can leave whenever you want. Both of these things were bad for the Legion because the initial contract that said we can keep you forever or until the war's over. Uh, that obviously scared a lot of people away. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that it was like, yeah, you know, you don't like it, you can leave. That also meant that it's been really difficult to, like, keep people and to do... You know, but it's, it's very easy to get de depressed, frustrated and scared at war. So mm -hmm. if you've got the ability to just jack it in any time you feel like it, yeah. you know, like something as simple as you falling out with some of your soldier mates or them calling you a dickhead because you fucked something up mm -hmm. can cause a guy to leave. You know, and they did all the time. So, you know, I mean, at least I stuck out seven months of that bullshit. You know what I mean? So, right. So, we you are now our property. Not a good idea. 
leave whenever you like, not a good idea. So some yeah, sort of if middle they, line. If they said six months, we're going to give you three months training, you'll be three months on the line, and then you can renew your contract in three or six months increments after that. That would have made perfect sense, and it would have given the Legion stability mm -hmm. and the people some security in about what the future held. You know, some security about what the terms really were. But because we didn't have that, mm. you know, I mean, we'd get things sometimes where some really good, someone would leave and then someone really good would come in and everyone's like, you know, that fucking new guy, he used to be a sergeant in the US Marines and he's really good. And everyone's like, you know, everyone likes him. Let's make him the new squad commander. Yay, new guy's the squad commander. Everyone likes new guy. And then new guy gets a message about that the 59th are doing some cool stuff down in Kherson and fucking gone. So we're back, back to square one. It's like, well, that was four weeks of bollocks wasn't it like all getting to know each other and being really enthusiastic that the squad's moving forward and finally we can do some fucking training you know okay. and then nothing and then they then they go and like yeah it was pretty frustrating really um I'm, yeah mm. apparently people got upset when i left because some you know some people didn't like me some people thought i was a really useful person yeah you know well i i, I did get a number of emails in response to uh the the uh videos that I put out interviewing you um, and some were to wish you well some were to congratulate you some were to say hi I passed a lot of them on to you some were offering work some were academics or, or people students who as far as I could tell were saying could you please write half my dissertation for me no don't uh, ask oh okay right um, but I did get um, a few it really is only a few um, and some of them are anonymous but people saying oh yeah uh, I saw the interview Thanks for putting it on your channel, but I've met this guy and possibly you ought to know X, Y, Z. Some of them were say, said some really nice things about you, but the alcoholism, for instance, alcoholism, maybe that's going too far, but the, the drinking mm. did get mentioned. Yeah. So someone noticed. Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, and uh, I, I, with discipline, you've just said yourself you weren't the most disciplined and you've, you've told us all that you punched an officer once. Well, yeah, but he you did hit You described the circumstance. He hit you first with a cigarette in his hand yeah. as well. Exactly. From behind when you'd beaten someone. I, I, well, we had a completely sporting wrestling match and he was roaring drunk and got carried let's away. Not, let's not revisit it, but OK. Um, uh, one of them said that nobody digs like Big Mac. That, that was a nice compliment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that there was one other man in the Legion and he was the least of the killing type soldiers. Right. But the best of the working type soldiers. And Digger Dave, another Brit. Right. If there's one man I could absolutely guarantee yeah. to hand a shovel and come back eight hours later and he'll still be working, mm -hmm. Digger Dave. And there's... You know, I'll tell you what, right? Some that doesn't sound very glamorous. People think that soldiers are all like look like bodybuilders and stuff. Well, all those guys, right, who take testosterone and steroids mm -hmm. and have all these really impressive muscles, none of them are any good at walking a long distance wearing heavy weight like like wearing a pack. Right. And none of them are any good at digging or like unloading a truck quickly, which are like the principal physical activities you need to do as a soldier. Right, yeah. You know. Building holes to hide in and mm -hmm. put equipment in and moving equipment into those holes, right? Right. They, they, they're your principal activities. They're yeah. rubbish at that and they're easier to shoot because they're bigger and they eat more food. So, yeah, if you want to be a tough, hard man, don't get into steroids and testosterone because it just makes you into a useless cartoon character who gets tired really easily. Okay. And Digger Dave was not like that at all. No. He could outwork... He Digger Dave with his yeah. with his beer belly and his and his mutton chops, you know, right. fifty years of age could outwork a dozen bodybuilders. So yeah, I may have been a good digger, and I worked bloody hard uh, getting mm -hmm. the positions built that we that they wanted built. But uh, Digger Dave, that's one of that. There okay. is a he man. Was he, should, one. he should get a military service medal for Ukraine because so services met, to entrenchments. Yeah, services to entrenchments. You know, right? And so digging. You say it's a lot, still a large part of uh, a soldier's work. It, we think of it as a, a very old-fashioned thing. It's low-tech. It's just a hole in the ground. There's no um, better body armour than it. You, it doesn't no. matter if you've got level four plus dragon skin everything. Mm. Nothing is going to protect you from, from bullets, blasts and explosions and shrapnel better than Mother Earth. Right. You know? 
Take, so, she'll take a pound in. And in your time, you have dug loads of trenches mm. and scrapes and the like, and you, you built a bunker, is that right? Well, we were building a whole complex that we were planning to spend the winter in with outlying fighting positions and everything. Mm. And then we went on the Kharkiv counter-offensive and we had to abandon them. <sighs> just I, I just liked, when you got it all carpeted and the I pine panelling. I liked building Castle Joe. You right. know, it was great. We had a big field of fire to cross the dam. We could have accounted for... Or our little platoon could have... We would have made them pay for every inch if they'd come across that field in the winter. But then we okay. abandoned in it, so... All right, you know. so you had your own little star fort. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of. It was like yeah. a triangle. There was three bunkers in a triangle formation with outlying javelin and machine gun positions. So, yeah, okay. something like that, you know. Yeah, all planned out. OK, and... You, uh, you even came up with uh, perhaps the next generation of military kit to help well, the soldier dig. Because what does someone who needs to dig, what, 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 what does he need? Well, um, we, when I was given these details to dig, one of the things that uh, I was asking for, and eventually, and I, I was asking for this item, and nice. getting what can only be described as like sort of blank stirs or alternative suggestions from the officers. And then she was like, sir, we really need a wheelbarrow to move the dirt. And they'd be like... Oh, well, you uh, tried Irish accents. Yes, to get yes, that. yes. Okay. So I was trying Irish and West Country because I thought it'd remind them... I thought it'd remind the officers of any, like, gardeners they might have had as a oh, boy. Oh, right, yes. You know, because it's like... So, you see, there's this thing called a wheelbarrow mm. and it helps you move this stuff called dirt far more efficiently, you see. And if I had one of them, I could get that bunker right. built quicker. And, you know, the other great thing about a wheelbarrow, sir, is you don't, you, you don't just have to put dirt in it. In, in fact, you can put tools or equipment or even people mm -hmm. in it, you know. Um, and now I, I end up buying my own wheelbarrow. And as soon as uh, I got a wheelbarrow, it suddenly became a very popular item well, that yes. people were forever borrowing to move water and ammunition and other things around. I, I have worked know? on many an archaeological dig. And you can have either buckets that hold that much, and then you, if you've got one, it's a really one-sided load, and two, still doesn't hold anything like as much as a barrow. And the barrow, most of the weight's on the ground, mm -hmm. so you've got a wheel. Uh, they're great things, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I've, uh, I'm now basically working with a friend of mine who's a actual, who was, in his time, a NASA engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're designing what I believe to be the perfect soldier's wheelbarrow. Uh, that will incorporate such features as uh, some extra tubes at the front of the tub so you can jam in a few branches and basically turn it into a stretcher. Right. Uh, so if you, say, had a wounded man, you know, getting a wounded guy, like a big 100 kilo plus guy, who's wearing body armour, yeah. you've still got to take, take, you can't just leave his gun, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to take that with you. All of that, Getting that up a real, like a 30 degree slope that's wet, made out of wet clay in the forest with a stretcher is just, it's hell. Mm -hmm. it's, it's even dangerous. But two guys in a wheelbarrow would just run him straight up there, no problem at all. And uh, I, I think that the, the, combat, the combat logistic and evacuation wheelbarrow is... Or, some, or battle barrow, for yeah, sure. Yeah, the battle barrow, Big Mac's battle barrow. OK, um, so it comes in camo... Colouring, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking like green, green, uh, beige, and then a fully beige, of course, a, yeah. a, a, a fully camouflaged up version. Mm. You know, comes with a built-in cargo net so you can secure your load, stuff like right. that. And the yeah. other thing, headlamps, I'm, GoPro mount, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know. And um, the other, the other thing I'm designing is basically a cart that will that's um, got a, a movable plinth on it, a, rot a rotating plinth, right. and a monopod that can fit a variety of heavy weapons. And using this, you'd be able to move down narrow little paths in the forest that an armoured car or a Land Rover would really struggle to. And even if they could, they'd make a lot more noise and uh, other signatures that yeah. make it detectable. You could drive this quad with your, your, little, mo your little narrow car that's got some form of heavy weapon on the back, like a 40 millimeter grenade launcher, right. or the old uh, 60 millimeter mortar, or the 51 like we had, yeah. and uh, or this uh, South African Dinelli 20 millimeter um, machine gun that fires the same sort of high explosive rounds that F-16 fighter jets do, mm -hmm. and drive that down the forest tracks until you see a gap of trees that give you a, a line of sight to Sorry, a... Sorry, but you just said 
the, the cars couldn't do it. So you, it's, it's a quad bike. Yeah, a quad that. bike that can go down narrower tracks and right. narrower bits of land uh, and find a spot in the trees where you can see the mm. burring that you're looking for, where, where your OP has detected some of the enemy, mm. and open up at a two to three kilometre distance, mm. harass and destroy that OP, and then drive away again very, very quickly inside a couple of minutes. And this this sort of car uh, right. is a thing that's been done in the past. Well, yes, and straight away I think of the poor T2 Pounder in World War II well, in yeah, North Africa. You, that... you, you're using, essentially, it's a, a mobile weapons platform uh, using the equipment that they had available. So it was a lorry there, but today you know, quad bikes we, exist. We were seriously talking about, yeah. uh, in Ukraine in the winter, do you think we can... And this, this was serious. Many people thought about it, and it seemed unlikely we could make it happen, but we liked the idea, let's get donkeys mm -hmm. for the winter. If we've got to get a couple of javelins and loads of machine gun ammunition from X to E, some donkeys in the winter might be like... Really... De-voiced. De oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the um, uh, the chindits in World War Two used de-voiced. In other words, you do a little uh, minor operation on the throat so they don't bray noisily. Yeah, yeah. I think we probably would have uh, asked for them to come like that. Uh, but yeah, that, get, but get, that, get an expert to do but that. that. But that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seemed at the, at the time, if there was a bad winter, yeah. that that might be one of the only viable ways of moving stuff around without mm. track vehicles, you know, do it on foot with donkeys. Um, so, uh, and the I, and then through talking about donkeys, I remember saying, guys, remember, have you ever seen these like British mountain two pounder guns we had back in the day? What was the range on them? Oh, four kilometers, they reckon, from sort of pit from peak to peak. I mean, That'd be great if we had one of them. We could be knocking out enemy OPs right now. Like a, a small artillery piece on the back of a donkey mm. would still have been viable in the environment they're in. The ability to knock out slightly defended and protected OPs and positions two to four kilometres away on rough terrain with narrow paths track okay. packs where you can only get a sight if you can move it to that exact spot. That sort of thing is very, very useful so on the front it, line. This happens again and again in, in military history where an idea is good, people forget about it and it has to be reinvented. Mm -hmm. um, and one something that people are talking about as going obsolete is the tank. Yeah, no. So people are forever saying, I've so many times I've heard, oh, you, you wouldn't get me in a tank. Now, there are so many things that can knock them out. Uh, there are so many other uh, weapons platforms that can do the job better or cheaper. But tanks are still formidable things. Yeah? Tanks are still very formidable things. The tanks aren't, the tank is not, uh, I, I cannot see the tank. I mean, a while prior to this war, Mm. All the sort of military experts from all over are going, yeah, tanks are on the way out. And, you know, we're not really sure if we need as many infantry as we used to. And there, there were military, like the British Army had just decided to cut a load of men and that mm. we might be cutting tanks. And, well, that's all out the window now, isn't it? Well, if every Tommy Atkins has got a shoulder launch thing that can take out a tank, then why would you ever put men in the tank? Well, yeah, you know, because, well, well tanks can do... Tanks can do things that people don't think about. Like, for instance, if we mm -hmm. think of where I was, you've got a river yep. and then two sides of a, of a valley, two hills, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, on one side there's us and the other side's the Russians. Mm -hmm. If I'm there with my... If there's a, a, a T-34, right, there's like a really, really old, completely obsolete mm -hmm. Russian tank that's driving up and down those forest tracks, right? Mm -hmm. The thing about those tank shells is they can shoot through an awful lot of branches and trunks, right, and still be an effective projectile that will carry on going where it's meant to go mm -hmm. and blow up and kill me and my friends, right? Right. We can't get a javelin to go through trees, right? You might hit a twig. Yeah. Like, if you want to stop a very sophisticated quarter of a million, million pound anti-tank guided missile... Stick your tank with some like bushes in, mm. in between it, and, and those bushes will really throw that missile out pretty effectively. Yeah. Um, it's strange how they can plow through loads and loads and loads of armor, but twigs and branches will stop them. But this is the way.
Mm. Basically, that's just how yeah. it happens. A, a so, tank has got tracks so it can go over terrain. That hasn't changed. Yeah. It's got armour that makes it bulletproof so it can advance on, on most infantry with impunity. That hasn't changed. Yeah, I mean... It, and it, it's got a big gun that goes bang. And, you, you know, you might say, oh, well, because a tank like a T-34, you know, mm. I can see someone in the comments going, well, if he was really knew what he'd on about, he'd know that an RPG could go right through a T-34. It's like, yeah, it can, mate, but you have to get within, like, 300 metres of it. And being 300 metres of a tank that's got a machine gun on it and is shooting a gun at you, and in your general life, with just... Do you know, to fire an RPG, you have to stand up and make sure you haven't got anything behind you, you yep. know? Uh, you and, there's, and then there's a great big blast, yeah, which tells and, everyone exactly where you are. And, uh, yeah, and it's still going to take... Like, by the time it hits the RPG, it might have still gone... <laughs> and machine gunned you. Right. So, basically, tanks of any sort are still incredibly dangerous mm. for human beings. And you say 300 yards, but I think that's pretty optimistic, isn't it? More if you're a really good RPG guy, you might be able to hit like a vehicle-sized thing at 300 yards, but you'd have to be good. I mean, you do see some of the guys in Afghanistan, like the, the Afghanis, who are like incredible <laughs> you know the, they they really can hit things with an rpg at five six hundred meters consistently okay but that's kind of all they've ever done you know that's the one that's the thing you know so uh normally yeah like we would was obviously a lot of the guys who i saw firing rpg had never fired one before mm. but a lot of the guys like from the eastern european armies had mm. and still you know, they're firing it and they've sort of been saying, oh, I'm going to be good at this. And next thing, the thing's like skipping off the floor or going into the... I mean, it's like a high explosive Nerf gun, really. They're wildly inaccurate. The, well, in, in, the, uh, in the Gulf War, the uh, second Gulf War, there was a, a case of uh, a British Challenger tank that uh, got immobilised and was hit... Oh, I'm going to have to check this. I think it's something like 80 times by RPGs and everyone inside was still fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that if you're a bit, if you're in a BMP or something, uh, oh, well. if you're in an old tank, but a modern tank, no, you you you're only asking to to go with God if you're if you're using an RPG against a modern tank, you know. Okay, so tank's still good. Yeah. Uh, trenches still Helicopters good. Helicopters still still effective and scurry. Mm. They're not going anywhere either. Mm. Um, trench is still good. I suppose, like, and if we'd all have stuff that was like 762 nato then for the kind of distances then like rifles would have still been good but like essentially like the the rifle just became a personal defense weapon mm -hmm. at the kind of distances yeah we were talking about of course we could have been fighting quite a different campaign within ukraine and we were you know i mean if i was suddenly going to be fighting my way through the tunnels and corridors of azov steel mm. a short assault rifle would probably be Brilliant, you know. Right. What about pistols? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, few people got them. Um, a lot of the, generally, you don't see many Ukrainians with them. Um, mm. Generally considered, a, you know, if you want to get yourself marked out, if you want to make yourself sniper fodder, wear a pistol. Because you look more like an officer. Yeah. Right. And at and, and the end of the day, right, the only thing that a pistol's really good for is like, shooting yourself if your rifle's broken and you're being overrun because if it's got to the like, all that not like, maybe if you're fighting untrained af you know untrained iraqis and afghanis all this room clearing transition to pistol because it's quicker that quicker than reloading your rifle maybe all of that actually means something but mm. really if you want to have a pistol well, you're a rifleman fundamentally, so have two or three extra magazines for your rifle, mm. and it, it, and make sure that your rifle is well maintained and is right. not going to break. So, you, so you know, with that extra ammo, you should be able to keep them at a distance. You fail with the rifleman if they get to pistol distance. Exactly. So. Yeah. Okay. You know. So, so why why bother why bother with a pistol really? Americans and, still like them, though. Don't yeah, they? they love them, but like the Americans are still fighting the last wars in their heads. You know, like like all armies always are. Mm. They still think that. Like very, very, very well drilled room clearing infantry techniques are like what is giving them the advantage. And it's like if your enemy has fundamentally like zero training and you have loads of training, then mm. that sort of thing does give you an advantage. But 
the difference between like a quite well trained infantry soldier and a really well trained infantry soldier once you get inside built up fighting is like minimal. Certainly, the experience of World War Two is that uh, urban fighting just eats up in units so quickly. You yeah, suffer so it many casualties. It doesn't matter. It doesn't so matter what, how no well how hard you, you try. You know, if you've got like, a, I mean, look at the Falklands. You know, we sent our best, the Paras, the Marines, up against mostly Argentinian conscripts. Yeah, and they ecstatic. They took quite a few of our best guys with people who had next to no training because defensive fighting with modern weapons is all on the side of the defender. Mm. You know, it's really easy. It's really easy, you know. You, you used to have to train someone for ages to be able to hit someone with a musket. You can hand anyone a rifle, and a, a modern military rifle, and they'll be able to hit a man-sized target at 200 metres the first time. Mm. Like, not the first round, but the first... By the time you've worked through uh, a couple of magazines, they'll, they'll be competent, you know? Mm. But uh, there's also the issue of not being able to shoot because you can shoot accurately enough, but there's also being able to identify and know when to shoot and when not to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, and this is my way of bringing up uh, the near blue-on-blue -blue, uh, action in which you were involved. Um, yeah. The Special um, Forces. Oh, yes. OK. So, yes. yeah, I mean, yeah, we had... Uh, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this in previous videos, but like we were given briefings and told about what other units were operating on our AO. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we totally fucking weren't at all, you know, and you'd just be down on an OP and suddenly like a couple of guys in uniform had come crashing through the forest. And normally that just was that normally that very quickly was ro resolved by the fact it's like, well, you've got yellow tape on. All right, mate, slather Ukraine. You know, and then and it'd be fine. And they a bit of yellow tape is quite easy to falsify, though. Well, yeah, but you know the, the Russians don't have any yellow tape, so it's okay. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't sell it there, so oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so things like that had happened, and like we did have some guys who basically, you know, the stuff going on that they get like we they've maybe neglected to tell us about, and then there's stuff that like we wouldn't get to know. So the the Ukrainian. Secret Service and SBU have got agents on the other side of the river and sometimes they're putting those agents in mm -hmm. or they're bringing them out on little boats in the in the middle of the night and it's all very sneaky peaky you know we'd, we were down on an OP in in very early in the morning and suddenly there's like four armed men coming up mm -hmm. and I I had I was basic I wasn't on duty at the time I think I was just like sat in the bottom of the OP being like Meh really tired and not focusing on much and then this Norwegian guy who's there it's like come on and we're like see these guys coming around the mm -hmm. corner and we they didn't have tape they didn't have anything that said Ukrainian and they weren't wearing normal Ukrainian like uniform and basically we were sort of about to shoot them mm -hmm. or we're not I'm not really sure what the plan is because I was looking to my mate then and like what are, you, what are we gonna do we're staying really quiet are we just gonna are we gonna like fucking Tommy gun them all in the back now, basically. Mm -hmm. Or, a, or a, and then they sort of turned round and went, Oi, Blatt! And the way that they said, Oi, Blatt, made us think that they were Ukrainians, not Russians. Just the accent. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we were like, Oh, Legion, Legion, Britannia, Britannia, Anglesey, and the, Oh, whoa, whoa, suka, fucking hell. We all just nearly killed each other then, didn't we? So, things Jeez. like that did happen quite regularly and you know you wonder like why you know it's it's so strange like when we were going on the counter offensive you know like we've been on ops and we've spent a lot of time really making sure that we are in fact camouflaged and stealthy mm -hmm. and you know uh that they can't see our positions etc 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 and then and then you know now we go on the counter offensive and it looks like it is playing accounts at some fucking Earthsoft event, you know, and we've actually got blue tape or yellow tape right. absolutely plastered on everything, and the vehicles have got a big white stripe on the roof and on the bonnets, you know. Yeah. So it's because at the end of the day, it's it's so easy to get confused yeah. who the enemy is, 
And, it, and obviously, you know, that can result in like a, a second of mistake mm. and accidentally shooting someone. Or it could actually mean that like two quite large components of your own army start having a full on fight. Yeah. Which could be really bad. So, yeah, it's uh, giving up stealth to prevent blue on blue. Yeah. Is, is, is what became the priority. You talked about uniforms, but uh, from pictures I've seen of the war, that there's not great uniformity on either side, and everyone's wearing sort of blotchy green stuff well, with he... all sorts of different packs. So from any sort of distance, everyone's in sort of universal military dinge. It'd be really, really hard to see whether someone was a Russian or a Ukrainian at 100 metres with a naked eye. It'd mm. be really difficult to see. Um, I mean, you know, I suppose it's pretty, probably people who've got twenty twenty vision would be like, oh, I'd be able to tell that. But like, what what about one hundred and fifty? What about if it was a bit like dusky or a bit a bit you know in the morning mm. or it was a little bit misty? You know, uh, yeah, it's it'd be difficult to say for sure. Um, I mean, the the fact that Wagner were fucking multicam, which is what all NATO forces were. You know what I mean? That. That makes things uh, more confusing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but uh, but yeah, the Ukrainian, generally speaking, the Ukrainian uniform is is uh, pretty standard. You know, okay. there are, they do have four patterns, but most people have the summer pattern Ukrainian uniform. You know. Okay, and you're putting this all down in your book. Mm -hmm. Will you be naming names in your book? Um, Everyone, uh, everyone who are, I've spoke to some people and they are happy to be named as them. Right. Other people have asked me to change their names. Fine. Other people, uh, the the dead, will keep their real names. Um, right. The uh, other other people uh, and uh, nationalities and events will be changed to protect people's identities and just make it a little bit harder for the KGB to come and kill us all one of these days. Okay. You know, uh, so yeah, but yeah, I will be, I will be naming, uh, there is one or two people who uh, I haven't got permission from who will be getting a mention, but uh, well, they shouldn't have pissed me off, should they? Oh, okay, it's like <laughs> that. And so... This will then, once it's published, will become part of the historical record. I guess so. I mean, perhaps that's... in many years to come, people will be looking at it, trying to get details from uh, the perspective of, of a man on the ground. Um, but you were also telling me of uh, instances where what the truth was wasn't just uh, morphing depending on many generations of, of researchers, um, but instead, in real time, the history was changing. Uh, so, uh, for instance, the incident with the, the white phosphorus. Oh, so, uh, yeah, you know, things can be very uh, confusing on they the can. front. And, um, you know, uh, mistakes happen, people get confused, people, uh, you know, leave the tap on. And uh, there'd been this position uh, down in the forest that Bravo were occupying, and... Um, uh, the, 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 that area, you know, I think I've mentioned this in another another video, Bogdan the Inept, he'd taken yes. a camera team to see this this house that was very architect architecturally distinct mm -hmm. in this area of forest. And he put this very architecturally distinct uh, thing with, here, I am here with the International Legion in secret location in forest. Very art architecturally distinct house. And then this house got blown to hell, right? Ah, and that, and then do you think these facts are related? Uh, well, we're, we're, we're coming to this. So this, right. so this, uh, this house that he, the commander, the inept commander had managed to get on the diversion and had been blown to hell, nearly got some of my friends killed. So again, you know, not helping his popularity. So in this time, this general area of forest is, um, getting, is getting shelled a lot more. And uh, apparently, uh, one of the, suddenly there's another house that's been destroyed and apparently the bastards have used white phosphorus. Uh, and to, to burn the house down, right? And and and, and it was really um, everyone was like very uh, woof, wow, you guys were lucky to get out. Mm. And then um, that's what everyone thought, right? For quite a while. And so that got entered in the official. That's uh, been in the official. Uh, I believe that in the official report. Okay. And um, it would appear now. Um, I have learned from sources that I will not disclose that it was not in white, white phosphorus, but oh. uh, someone was making a bacon sandwich. And just sort of uh, walked away and like left the gas on, 
and it oh. and it caught and uh, <laughs> they, they burnt the new platoon house down. <laughs> so to uh, perhaps uh, cover cover the uh, no, I think it was white phosphorus. Yeah, it was definitely it was, it was a white, white phosphorus shell. Okay. Um So yeah, there are a few little things, few little things like that, you know. Um, yeah, and then you know, of course, at the at the start when when Yaraviv, uh, when the missile attacks happened, there were people who were absolutely adamant that it was Su twenty sevens, and no, that it was that it was faster jets than that, and no, no, it was Smirches fired from the Belarusian border, and that there were people who were, were adamant that it was X, Y, and Z, and these people were trained soldiers as well. Mm. Um, and then it turned out it was caliber missiles and, you know, a few people who were, like, quite quite adamant at the time just suddenly became a bit quiet about the whole issue. All right. Well, at least it wasn't bacon, because that okay. stuff could be deadly. Yes. Uh, right. So, um... You're back, you're working on other things, you're putting the book together, you're most of the way through that. Uh, we will, of course, uh, keep you informed of uh, when the book comes out and how it can be bought. Um... You are someone who's quite unusual because most people who fight in a war are either conscripted or they were regular soldiers who, who had, had signed up and they were trained. Mm -hmm. But you volunteered, not as a trained soldier, and you were not conscripted either. Mm. Are you unusually brave? I don't know. I'm not... I definitely feel I know some very brave people, but, like... Have anything I've done been brave or am I just the right kind of detached at times? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember being uh, being about 17 and, and driving and I, I, I hit this roundabout and there was a patch of oil right. and suddenly my car was, was spinning and spinning and I remember being completely calm mm -hmm. as I adjusted the steering wheel and regained control of the vehicle. And then afterwards, like, whoa, 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 I nearly died there. But mm -hmm. in that moment, I was as detached from the potential danger I was in okay. and as you had possible moments like to that in Ukraine, did you? Yeah, just, just kind of, there's perhaps, perhaps like there's, whether, whether it's bravery or... A certain kind of detachment, or, or exactly the right kind of mental illness. <laughs> okay, well, you could say, say? It's, it's being controlled. You have priorities. When the danger, when you're in that tremendous danger, you have a lot of other priorities. And if you can just focus on what you need to do immediately, you can do all your panicking later. Yeah, and I think also as well, I'm I've always been a very like moral and, and principled person. I'm 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 far from a I'm far from a saint, mm. you know, but principles and, and what I believe to right be right and wrong is something that's always been very important to me. So I think that was, yeah, that was a major factor for me as well. Just doing, living up to my sense of what I thought was right. Okay. And you had to tell your parents at some point, mm -hmm. mother, father, I've decided to do this. Yeah, I, I spoke to them, but they, they, you know, they didn't want me to go, but they also knew that it that they agreed with my statement that it was the right thing to do right. um, and that, you know, someone needed to do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's not like I had a, a, a really, you know, popping career or I just got married and had, no, and had a new child at the time, no, you know. You're still your mother's son. Does it, does it nag at you at all that you, you must, to some degree, be putting other people under some pressure? I suppose, yes, but, you know... It, when war happens, people have to make sacrifices, you know. And mm -hmm. if you if you uh, were more worried about whether you know, so f feelings aren't important, really. You know, f what's important and right, what's right and wrong, and stopping a dictator is important. What some people's feelings about that they wish that the war wasn't happening, or they wish it didn't have to be their son, or mm -hmm. you know. They're not really important, and you know there's a there's a difference between emotional importance in this life, you know. And I think people should try and be more aware of that sometimes. Oh, okay. Not you, just you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Well, uh, if there ever is a, a, a fight, I do hope you're on my side. Thank you very much, Lloyd. <laughs> okay. Well, and uh, from Lloyd and from me, good night. Good night. <laughs>